My name is Jackie Moulton. I was a detective with the Metropolitan Police for over 25 years. My real life experiences on the front line as a woman investigating crime became the inspiration for the TV drama Prime Suspect. Oh, good morning. My name's Jackie Moulton. Once a detective, always a detective. It never leaves. And now I'm going back on the road, on the job, and I'm looking at some of the worst crimes ever committed in the UK. In a series of exclusive interviews, I'll be talking one-to-one -to, -one to detectives and experts to find out how they brought the killer to justice. This is a story of what it takes to find the real prime suspect. Today I'm going to be revisiting the abduction of Muir Mackay, who was married to Alec Mackay. Alec Mackay was number two to the press baron, Rupert Murdoch, who previously purchased News of the World. What had happened was that Mrs Mackay was taken from her home in Arthur Road in Wimbledon. And the sad thing is that her body has never been found to this day despite two men being convicted of her murder. I'm looking forward to speaking to Peter Rimmer. He is the only officer left who was on the Mural Mackay case from the first day until the conviction of the Hussein brothers. Peter Rimmer, it's Jackie Moulton, one of your ex-colleagues from the Metropolitan Police. Oh, hello, Jackie. I'd be very interested to speak to you, Peter, because you are the last remaining officer alive, I think, who was on the Mural Mackay case way back in 1969 from the first day of the investigation until its conclusion when the Hussein brothers were convicted of her murder. That's correct, and, uh, and sadly that is correct that I am the last one, yes. I wondered if um, you would be so kind, Peter, that I could come and see you uh, to discuss your involvement throughout the whole of that case. Oh yes, there's no problem there. Um, I look forward to meeting you. And you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. The kidnap occurred on the 29th of December, post-Christmas, awaiting, you know, New Year. They were originally from Scotland, so I'm sure would have enjoyed celebrating the New Year. And she was at home waiting for her husband to come home for dinner. The dog was sitting by the fire. It was all warm and cosy, and her world changed in a second. It was the first time in British crime history that the police ever had to deal with the kidnap. But this case remains largely forgotten, but why? It had all the intrigue and the plot that could be taken straight from a thriller. Mr Mackay came home last night expecting to meet his wife, who uh, should have been indoors. The doors were open, uh, his wife wasn't there. Their uh, uh, shoes were on the stairs, uh, going out shoes. If she'd have been walking out, uh, she would have been wearing these shoes. But her driving shoes are missing, and her car is in the car park. I've been trained as a hostage negotiator, so I knew that was one of the hardest course, in fact, that I'd ever been on in my service, because it is dealing with people who are on the edge. They're making these demands of the police. And the police weren't quite sure initially what they were dealing with. Peter, we've come back to Arthur Road in Wimbledon. Yes. Uh, the house is behind us. Yeah. 
Has it changed much? Hardly at all. It's poignant to be back here after such a long time. The house is the same and the fence I even looks the same. It's almost as it was 50 years ago. Because one of the things we mustn't forget about this case is that Mrs Mackay was mistaken for Mrs Murdoch. Exactly that. They thought they were following uh, Rupert Murdoch's wife. They'd gone back to Australia for Christmas and that's why, they had the, why the family had the car. So when you came to the house, was your job to be with Mackay's when waiting for the call to come through to monitor it? We were waiting for any contact from the people who had taken her, whether it be in a letter or by telephone. How had they got Mrs Mackay to open up the front door? That is something we don't know. There was no evidence of actual force used on the outer door, the first front door. But then again, of course, they left such an obvious crime in there. The yes. professionalism of it, because they left so many clues. Yes. Could you imagine in this modern day, with what we know now about DNA, what would have been in that house? Exactly. Would have been found them in two minutes. But to put it again in context, so it was the time then there was a lot of publicity about Mr Murdoch purchasing, you know, the news of the world some. Yes. This would be an opportunity to kidnap the wife. Yes. Based on the information that Murdoch was extremely wealthy. Yes, and I remember that they asked for it in relatively small denominations. I think it was fives. And tens. That, and tens. Because they asked for a million pounds and then yes. they broke it down yes. to so, two suitcases with 500,000 in each. What they didn't realise, how big and how heavy that amount of money was. The uneasy relationship that exists between the police and the press undoubtedly hindered this particular investigation. But no one could have foreseen what happened next. The Mackay family were about to place themselves centre stage in the world spotlight in a bid to get Muriel Mackay back. This is an interview recorded at the time. And it must be a crank because to ask a million pounds ransom is just incredible anyway. And my mother hasn't any enemies. She's, she's happily married? Very happy. We're a very happy family and always have been. And, well, there's no, no reason. It's incredible. I'm en route to meet a former Fleet Street journalist who knows the story well and how the press itself made headlines for the way this story unfolded. Robin Girossi, you're a journalist, and I want to talk to you about the Mural Mackay case. The Mackay family thought that if they could use their own newspaper, so to speak, yeah. as a way of getting the story out, that that would help the investigation. Yes. I mean, it was difficult for the police in one sense because um, normally if somebody had been kidnapped, the, the family would just say, you're the police, you know what you're doing, please just lead us along in this. Um, but in this case, it was a press baron, or certainly his right-hand man, and he wanted to actually play some active part in what was, what was happening. I think the police were rather surprised when they turned up uh, and they started to gather at, um, at the Wimbledon home. They were, they were rather surprised to find that the Sun editor, Larry Lamb, was already there with a photographer and a reporter. So uh, the press were involved from the word go. And the, the problem that created immediately was that at 1.15, when the, the first call came in from the kidnappers, the police were immediately questioning whether it was genuine or not because they knew that the, the media had already started to put the story out. Mm. So was this first phone call a genuine call or was it a crank call or a prank mm. or hoaxers? Immediately it starts creating problems for the police. Well, it changes the dynamic of the investigation. And what I mean about that, Robin, is the dynamics is that the police are the experts, the police are the investigators. Yeah. And it seems that in this particular case, you know, the press, it's the, you know, tail wagging the dog. Yeah. But the police are responding to information that's been fed to the press um, because normally one wouldn't feed the press in uh, any story in relation to a kidnap because it is about yeah. the urgency sure. in getting back Mrs Mackay. Yeah. I think part of the problem was, of course, that this was a completely new 
area, wasn't it? I don't think anyone in this country, press or police, were used to dealing with these kind of abductions mm -hmm. for, for ransoms. And uh, there wasn't a kind of way of doing it at that time. And it, and it wasn't helped by, a fact, by the fact, of course, that Alec Mackay was a senior mm -hmm. uh, newspaper executive. So it, it was a bad mix. Um, and it created a lot of problems for the police, without doubt. Appeal to you to contact me by telephone, letter or telegram. My son or sons-in-law are ready to meet you or any intermediary anywhere on my behalf. One man who remembers the extraordinary public broadcast made by Mr Mackay to the kidnapper was a detective who was fresh on the job. He also remembers an extraordinary twist in the investigation when some help came along that was truly out of this world. David Bowen, in 1969, you were a trainee detective constable within the Metropolitan Police, and you were seconded to the incident room regarding the case of Muriel Mackay. Yes, that's right. Do you think that the involvement with the press had any implications for the investigation? It really did hamper the case, uh, hamper the investigation. The fact that it had, he'd gone on the news asking for all that help because the telephones in the incident room, they didn't stop ringing. And we had to record the names and addresses of the people who were ringing in and briefly what the information was that they were giving us. And of course, eventually, all of that had to be investigated, all of those calls. And eventually, there was uh, information came in about from a medium. And of course, uh, the medium came in and pinpointed a, a farm in Essex and said that Mrs. Mackay was being held at that farm in a green shed behind the farmhouse and that there is a stream going along, winding down, down the hill behind the farmhouse. So we went out there at two o'clock in the morning one night and had a look around, searched, searched around, couldn't find any trace or anything like that, no evidence whatsoever. And then it was quite strange that eventually when the Hussein brothers were arrested, that was at Rook's Farm, but this was in Hertfordshire. And I believe that there's a green kennel behind the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And there was, again, a stream wending its way at the, at the bottom of the hill behind the farmhouse. Did you get a sense that the police were leading the investigation? Initially, I think that the media were taking over the investigation, but very quickly after that, the police uh, took charge of the investigation and it was run, run on their lines. For the police to seize full control of the investigation was the only hope Mrs Mackay ever had of being found alive, but the clock was ticking. I'm en route to meet a detective who knows all about the golden hours that follow a crime, especially a kidnap. Lessons were being learned from the off on this case. Roy, you're a very experienced retired detective now. In your experience uh, within kidnap inquiries, for example, what's the procedure with police and the media? Almost like a murder, those first 24, 48 hours are critical. You really don't want to go wide in those early hours. The Mackay case could have been a watershed. It alerted the police that they needed to have an arrangement which, in effect, formed a partnership with the press. And so uh, there was a protocol established, certainly during the 90s, where if a life was at risk, and that's a key element, you could ask the editors to hold back. But things had progressed too quickly in the case of Mrs Mackay. It was too late to hold back. All the police could do now was to press on and try to find out where she was being held and what exactly had happened to her. The kidnapping of Muriel Mackay was one of the new sensations of the 1960s. It was a case of mistaken identity. The incident room was the hub where all potential leads about Mrs Mackay's whereabouts were being fed be they real or imagined, from prank callers or letter writers. 
I'm en route to meet a man who found himself being given a baptism by fire on the job when he found himself working in the Mackay incident room. Peter, what was it like then in, for you as a trainee detective in the incident room? We had so many inquiries to follow up through the uh, action books, as it were, uh, that it was non-stop. Mm -hmm. The pressure was enormous. Were you involved in, uh, with the Mackay family at all? I was one of the officers who spent sometimes days with them. It's a very difficult time to be with anybody in those circumstances because we were there with the family who were grieving, hoping that their mother was coming back. And at the same time, we were all waiting for messages or telephone calls from the people who had her. It seemed to me that there was quite a distance between the ransom calls and the, and the subsequent ransom calls. That caused a lot of problems because we were forever waiting for contact from them. And of course it, um, it didn't come at some times for about a week or more. Did the atmosphere change when the first letter came through? That changed everything because then it, the reality hit home that she had actually been abducted. Darling Alec, I am deteriorating in health and spirits. Please cooperate. Excuse the writing. I'm blindfolded and cold. Yeah. Please keep the police out of this if you want to see me. Muriel. Yeah. That's very chilling. It is. And of course, this is what convicted them of murder. This is one of the main reasons why they were convicted without a body, because that says it all. The second letter, I understand, was sent by Mrs. Mackay to her daughter, Diane. Dearest Diane, I heard you on TV, heard you, which still indicates that she's blindfolded. She didn't see her but she heard her daughter's voice. Would you please persuade Daddy to cooperate with M3 Gang? They will telephone you giving that code, number M3. Yeah. You will then be sure you are speaking to the right party. Act quickly for my sake, dear. Please keep police out of it if you want to see me again. Act discreetly as the gang is too large to fall, all my love to you all, Mum. Yeah. You know, it's very, very sad. Brilliant. And I think this thing, again, about the gang being, you know, quite large, M3 Mafia, they're trying to yes. indicate that it's not two brothers in a farmhouse yeah. in Hertfordshire. Yeah. Here, this whole desperation of Mrs Mackay. It's just beyond thinking, isn't it, what another human being does to another human being and the pure, you know, desperation. She's lost, she's bewildered, she doesn't know where she is, she's blindfolded, yes. she's cold. And I think, Peter, when you actually see the letter, see Mrs. Mackay's own handwriting, that you feel the desperation within the yeah. letter, that makes it even more chilling. Yes, it does than it is. It brings yeah. it all home, makes it more real. Yes. The letters written by Mrs. Mackay were haunting, not knowing whether she would live or die. Hello? Oh, hi, Roger Street, ex-commander from the Metropolitan Police. It's Jackie Moulton, former colleague of yours. And um, I wondered if you would be prepared to talk to me, Roger, about your involvement as an investigator on the Miura Mackay case way back in 1969. Well, hello, Jackie. Yes, I'd be very pleased to. I need to know more about how this drama unfolded once the letter from Mrs Mackay had been received. The statement from Mr Mackay says, would you please inform me what I have to do to get my wife back what do you want from me? I'm willing to do anything within reason to get my wife back. Please give me your instructions and what guarantee I have that she will be safely returned to me. 
I'm going to speak to the detective who became involved in the bid to get Mrs Mackay back with a ransom drop. On the 1st of February, instructions were received for Ian, the Mackay's son, to bring half a million pounds up the A10 to High Cross in Hertfordshire. But Ian Mackay wouldn't be in the car. His place was to be taken by Detective Sergeant Roger Street. Because I was thought to look something like Ian Mackay, uh, uh, the boss said to me, he said, um, we've got a job for you. We want you to uh, impersonate Ian Mackay and go and meet the kidnappers. And what did you feel about that? Well, I, I was a young detective sergeant. I mean, I, I thought I was invincible. I thought that was going to be very exciting and something I'd, I'd really enjoyed doing, yeah. So the instructions that you got, can you remember what they were? We were told to go to certain places. Uh, I remember one, one was a telephone kiosk. I went in and, uh, and there was a note there and it, it said drive off to another location, to another village further up towards... Um, into Hertfordshire and it said um, that there would be a, a grass bank uh, at this junction in the road where there would be some white flowers, imitation flowers put on the side of the road. And when we got there, sure enough there were. We were told that I would have to leave the suitcase with the money in it, buy the white flowers and then, then to clear off. We went off somewhere else somewhere away from the scene and waited there until we heard that the money hadn't been collected because something had obviously gone wrong uh, and so we drove back and we picked the money up. How did you feel then when you kind of the bag's not picked up and it's going to be a no-no and you have to go back and get the bag? Well it was frustrating and disappointing I mean we, we, we as I said we we set off with high hopes uh, and unfortunately it came to nothing in retrospect, looking at it, with the benefit of all the things that you have at hand nowadays, 50 years on, you realize just how under provided for we were as an investigation team. Also pulled in on this first unsuccessful drop was my old team, the Flying Squad. Tony Stevens, in 1969, you were a detective sergeant on the famous, on the elite flying squad within the Metropolitan Police. Yes. So how come the flying squad were involved in this? Well, there was only one squad, flying squad vehicle involved in it, and that was us, and that was um, a DI, me as sergeant, and a DC with me as well. I think we started off somewhere around Old Street, I think we picked it up, and the first telephone call and then went north from there to various places and, and several different telephone calls to different places. The uh, money was put out on the verge, um, but it stayed in the verge and nobody came to it. But there was a suspicious vehicle that drove past. Passed it, twice, I think. We pulled into a cafe past the, the drop zone. After a while, this Volvo came in quite slowly and one of its lights was out and it was um, um, a bit dirty. Perhaps, perhaps it was muddy, I don't know. And the and occupants? In, they were two Indians, yeah. Two Indians in the car? Yes. Did you follow that car or no. leave it? It just drove through and out again, basically. Um, but the instructions were, were to leave it and anything that came through. And, and it, so it came in, went back out. We then stayed there, basically, for two, or two, two and a half hours. In the end, it was thought by about two o'clock in the morning that they weren't going to pick it up. And uh, it was called off. The failure of the ransom drop saw Alec Mackay making another appeal for his wife's safe return. Of course, I am terribly worried, I am frantic that I can get my wife back again. What can I do? I'm only asking the cooperation of everybody who may be watching, who may be listening, or may be reading, to please help us to get her back again. Unfortunately, the kidnappers refused to surrender. Instead, they warned the police if there were any more tricks, Mrs. Mackay would be killed. The kidnappers now set a new date for the handover of the money, Friday, February the 6th. On that day, police were sent on a goose chase between telephone boxes and tube stations around London. 
The phone rang at Epping Station telling them to take a taxi to Bishop Stortford and leave the money opposite a minivan parked on the forecourt of Gates Garage. The cases were deposited as requested, but before they could be collected, they were disturbed by passers-by. Once again, the drop had failed, and Mrs Mackay's life now hung in the balance. The failure of the two ransom drops now left the police waiting for new instructions from the kidnappers. Tony Stevens was one of the detectives involved in the next stage of the investigation. This involved trying to trace the driver and passenger of a Volvo sighted near the ransom drop. We'd been on a search on North Weald Airfield first and found nothing there and then thought we should perhaps go and have a look around and see what we could find out in the area. And we went around asking local people, did they know a couple of Indians at all? Because it was apparent by that time. And um, we found somebody who said, um, yeah, there's a couple of Indians have got a farm up the road. Um, they've been there some time. And we got up on top of this hill with binoculars and looked down on the farm and saw that it was a pig farm. And we lay on the top and um, saw the brothers coming in and out on the farm. Did you see the Volvo? Yes. Okay. We saw the Volvo at that time. The men of Indian ethnicity the police were after were in fact from the West Indies in the Caribbean. Two men who would be eventually identified as the Hossein brothers. In a police swoop, they were arrested at the farm. Whilst there was no sign of Mrs. Mackay, there was evidence of the kidnap. Evidence enough to see them brought in for questioning. David Bowen, I understand that you kind of spoke to them, as was the norm, after they'd been charged to take their antecedents. That's to find out about their kind of background history, how long they'd been, their occupation, etc. What can you tell me about the Hussein brothers? What I do remember is speaking to them both. Uh, Arthur Hussein, uh, who was the older brother, I think he was 30, 35, something like that. And Nizamuddin Hossein, who was about 21 at the time. I thought that uh, Nizamuddin Hossein was a strong character, but then I started thinking about it, and really the brains behind it seemed to be Arthur Hossein, because he was older for a start, but Nizamuddin Hossein, he seemed more of a criminal than Arthur Hossein. Streetwise? More streetwise? Uh, yes, he seemed to be, as if he'd been involved in more criminality than Arthur Hussein in the past. The brothers Arthur and Nizamuddin Hossein had been born in Trinidad. Arthur came to England in 1955 and worked as a tailor's cutter, but his dream was to become a landowner. So, in 1968, he borrowed heavily to buy Rook's farm, plunging himself into debt. Perhaps this is what led him to come up with such a harebrained scheme to get rich quick. Arthur was quite odd, in as much as he was very chatty, as if nothing had happened. Nizamuddin, his brother, was obviously very concerned. As the evidence piled up against them, Nizamuddin became more introvert, whereas Arthur didn't seem to change. What there can be no doubt about is that the brothers committed the crime together. And as the interview progressed, the hope was that one of the pair would crack and reveal what had happened to Mrs Mackay. What did the Hussein brothers say when asked what happened to Mrs Mackay? They never ever answered that question, either of them. And to this day, we don't know where she is. With no side of Mrs Mackay, the police's worst fears were becoming a reality, and the hunt was now on to find her body. A search area of almost 50 square miles was scoured from the home counties down to the Thames. Ken, in 1969, you were a member of the Metropolitan Police Underwater Search Unit. Yes. What did that entail? 
it was a frogman team and it was four or five of us who were interested in diving and basically they just sent you anywhere the Thames canals looking for bodies and jewelry and whatever you were told to look for at what point was the underwater search team brought in to the investigation? Initially, we thought they had some information, i.e. search that pond, so we didn't know. I mean, we weren't told. We were just told to go and dive into it. Uh, it was very icy, and we had to break the ice on the top, of course, so we were a bit suspicious whether, you know, the body had gone in there, but still we did that. But subsequent to that, of course, it went on for sort of 30, 40 days, I believe, uh, and we sort of dived in just about every bit of water, I think, that was in the home counties, I think, where people were suggesting that a body might be. So we didn't have a day off for a month, and um, so we got to learn all the waterways in London, including the canals and uh, ponds and swimming pools even. In that search, Ken, did you find any bodies? Yes. Yes, we did. Um, not bodies they wanted, unfortunately, you know, and which uh, didn't please the investigation team because obviously they had to, we were sidetracked then, and, uh, but that was it, we had to do it. I can only imagine, you know, that kind of job of finding bodies is not really one to be kind of envied of because of the very nature of water and distortion and fishes having a go at the body. That's a kind of a gruelling job. You can only ever see that much even then, even though it's clean and people call the Thames a lot cleaner, you can only ever see that far in front of you. So when you come across a body, it is, you're up pretty close to it, and so it can be frightening. And what toll did it have on you? I think after four, four over four, nearly five years, um, I, I had, had enough. It was just too many bodies being found. Hussein brothers, it turned out to be, were a pair of amateurs, and Mrs. Mackay did not stand a chance. This poor woman that was abducted from her home and subsequently murdered. I think the Hussein brothers wanted to get rid of her quite quickly. They felt that um, they wouldn't be ever convicted of a murder if there wasn't a body. Roy, in your experience as an SIO, how difficult is it to get a prosecution where there are no bodies? Or how difficult is it to dispose of a body? If you cut from pubis to throat and you open up, what I say, unzip the body, there's an awful lot of material that you've got to be dealing with. And um, it would take an awful lot of planning to dispose of a body um, with some certainty that it would never be discovered. Because there's that old adage, isn't there, that is probably very true, you know, every contact leaves a trace. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And, um, and of course, we're much more acute now at finding that uh, trace element, that contact point. Um, um, I have to say, some offenders, bad people, actually equally bring up their game so that they fail to leave a trace. It's not impossible. Mm. In this particular case, of course, Mrs Mackay was never found, but the police, when they searched Rook Farm, they found all sorts of things with continuity of evidence, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the anastopast, you know, um, elements of the twine that had been used. There was considerable evidence that the police found, letters or handwriting examples, implications that the Hossein brothers had been involved in this, but of course there was no indication that Mrs Mackay had ever been there or indeed had died there. Well, I think if we look at the Mackay case, it, it was really the benchmark in understanding that a murder conviction could be reached by a jury um, in the absence of the body, the uh, corpus delecti. Um, and so thereafter, there was never any doubt in the English judicial system um, that uh, it was safe to convict. For the SIO, I think it had a whole new dimension. So you would actually look for other strands of evidence that, whilst not pointing to a living person, would tell you beyond reasonable doubt, tough test, beyond reasonable doubt, that person has deceased and is with us no more. To find Mrs Mackay, be it alive or dead, was now almost exclusively the focus of the police investigation.
With still no sign of a body in the waterways or on land, it was the press who developed a new theory of what may have happened to Mrs Mackay's corpse. What do you think happened to Mrs Mackay? Well, the rumour at the time was that um, the Husseins, being farmers and having a, somewhere between a small holding and a farm, had access to pigs and that the pigs have a capacity to devour the whole human torso. That, that's got to include the skull, of course, and the long bones. And whilst uh, I can't say that it's impossible, it challenges me to think that was the case. Um, and I would like some forensic appreciation of whether or not the pigs were so capable of devouring a corpse that there'd be no trace at all. I'd like to think these days uh, that would not be the case. But as with so many aspects of this case, the various scenarios surrounding what happened to Mrs Mackay's corpse continue to divide opinion. From my personal experience of when I was a boy working on a farm in Wales, I don't think that was possible. I made my point clear then. Um, but that, unfortunately, came from the press. That, as far as I know, never came from any source other than the press. And the reason being it never came from any source other than the press is the police had no evidence. It no. was pure speculation. The, absolutely. I mean, the search at the farm was relentless. It went on for a long time, involved a lot of officers. I'm pretty sure that never happened. And it was just very sad for the family that that was said. So in kidnap, you've got a live you know, body that's difficult to manage and to care for. Do you think that Mrs Mackay had been killed quite early on? I think that probably within, certainly within two weeks of them kidnapping her, I personally believe that uh, she was murdered within that time period. Mm. And then uh, that was the, one of the reasons why the ransom demands were more sporadic, because they, they couldn't produce uh, any more evidence that she was alive. With no body, no witnesses, and in an era before DNA, the trial at the Old Bailey went ahead and rested on one key piece of evidence. At the trial, when the defence finished their evidence on the fingerprints, the prosecution counsel, who I think was the Attorney General, he was given the opportunity of questioning the defence uh, expert, who um, then agreed in his opinion, that the other fingerprints were the uh, brothers. So you now you've got two fingerprints experts, one for the prosecution, one for the defence, both agreeing with each other... That all the other fingerprints did belong to the two brothers. And, and these fingerprints, of course, were on the paper flower, flowers that were used for the drop, and on certain documents and en envelopes that were sent to the family with Mrs Mackay's letters in. Were there any admissions made by yes. the Hussein brothers? Nizamuddin's barrister went away with, with Nizamuddin and then came back with admissions, certain admissions. And Nizamuddin then, from that point on, blamed his brother Arthur. You see, once the fingerprint evidence came out, like it did, it linked all of those demands and that linked to her letters to the family mm. and of course they were totally responsible for what happened to her because they, she was in their hands. Mm. Found guilty of all charges, the Hussein brothers were sentenced to life imprisonment. Arthur died in prison but Nizam served 20 years and was deported to Trinidad after his release. The Hussein brothers, Arthur Hussein, he died in prison some time ago, but his younger brother, Nizam Hussein, remains living in Trinidad, but he has the secret of where the body of Mrs. Mackay is. And sadly, by the looks of it, he's going to take that secret to his own grave. When a body is not found, of course it must 
put a void on the investigation and more importantly, a void in the life of the Mackay family. I think one of the saddest things was Mr. Mackay wanted and asked, he said, I just want to take a bunch of flowers to the place where my wife is. Dr. Julian Bruin, forensic psychologist, this case refers to the disappearance, abduction of Muriel Mackay way back in 1969, the wife of Alec Mackay, deputy to Rupert Murdoch. One of the things, having researched this case at depth, is the void that is left for the Mackay family. Extraordinary trauma and sadness without any form of closure. What's that about not telling? One of them is dead now, having twice made an appeal through the courts and also the tribunals to get her. No success whatsoever. And one of the reasons for that is he's absolutely insisting that he had nothing to do with it. And to the extent he made any accusations at all, he said it was his brother. And the other one was insisting it was his brother. Um, not uncommon for that sort of thing to happen, of two people acting together. Reality, we strongly believe, is that they were both acting together. So why did they not tell? I think it's they want that just to be shut down. They don't... And I, there's another thing, I'm afraid, which is somewhat chilling. I don't think they really care, actually, about it. They don't want to acknowledge they've done it, and they'll stay with that cosy line till their death day. Even in the court, uh, the boys, particularly Arthur, was distinctly arrogant and um, self-centred. So they sort of um, accused him of murdering poor Mrs Mackay and the blackmail and all the rest of it. Then he holds up his hands like that, with fingers splayed apart, and says, these are the hands of an artist, not a murderer. Uh, that tells you the mismatch of his perception of the world and reality. And it was that that led him to overextend himself financially to buy the farmhouse. Um, that which I think led him to this harebrained scheme, which had so many flaws in it, it was un untrue. But like you, it is abhorrent to me that someone could deprive the Mackay family of knowing, if not even what happened, where she is. The case is definitely one that is etched on the minds of all who worked on it, filled with details you can never forget. Where does this sit for you, the case of Mrs Mackay? One of the biggest and probably one of the, the cases where British policing learnt most. Mm. And I think as well, although you did get the Hussein brothers who were convicted, yeah. it remains unfinished business. M most certainly. A lot of my old colleagues have unfortunately died since, but everybody was of the same opinion. That's what it was, unfinished business. I served for 30 years and it was the biggest case and the, one of the longest cases probably in British criminal history, I should think. The tragic kidnapping and murder of Mrs Mackay led the police to develop a new approach and procedures to dealing with such crimes. Despite advances in technology, these procedures remain in place to this day. What happened thereafter? was that specialist teams started to be developed. So there is a highly polished kidnap squad that the Metropolitan Police have today in 2020. That evolved from the abduction of Mrs. Mackay. So lots of things, I think, evolved from this case to where the police are now sitting in 2020 with highly sophisticated teams investigating homicide, hostage negotiating, and kidnap, and the like. Yet for me, 
This isn't to be remembered as a story about the police learning from their errors. It remains a human story at its heart about a loving family denied closure. I feel frustrated over 51 years later that Mr Mackay and his family have no place to put any flowers down in the memory of his wife and their mother and probably grandmother by now. That's really, really sad. And one man, Nizam Hussein, holds the key to that information. And there is a sense of frustration, helplessness, that after this man dies, Nizam Hussein, the secret dies with him. And that's the bit that is really kind of hard as to why Nizam Hussein doesn't have it within him to give some form of peace to this family as to where Muriel Mackay was buried.